Now let's talk about a type 3 autoimmune disorder called systemic lupus erythromatosis, also known as SLE, also known as lupus. So this is a type 3 reaction, and if you recall, a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction involves generating antibodies, in this case autoantibodies, against soluble molecules. And in this case, we're talking about soluble self-antigens. And these um, immune complexes, a combination of antibodies and soluble antigens, tend to lodge in certain parts of the body, causing inflammation and damaging organs and tissues. In the case of SLE, the soluble self-antigens include DNA, histones, ribosomes, and other ribonucleotide proteins. Now, it's, what's interesting is to think about the fact that it's possible to make antibodies to something that is found inside of cells. Because as we've learned before, to generate an antibody response, antibodies typically interact with what we call extracellular antigens, uh, molecules found outside of cells, which is true. Antibodies do not enter cells. But it is possible for B cells to be activated um, via contents that, that were once originally found inside a cell. So let's see how that could occur. So here I've drawn a pretty simple cell and I've drawn a nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you find some DNA wrapped around uh, purple histone proteins. So I've wrapped them around and I've formed a few nucleosomes. So the purples are histone proteins and the um, string around it, that's the DNA. And in the nucleus, let's say we've got some ribosomes. So these consist of proteins and RNA. So this is a cell, pretty simple cell. Now, cells die all the time in our body. They die via apoptosis, they die via, via necrosis. So cell death, not a problem. Now, when cells die, they could release their contents into humors or uh, interstitial fluid or uh, the plasma of the bloodstream. So it is possible to find histone proteins, ribosomes or ribosomal proteins, or even DNA floating in your humors, in your lymph, in your interstitial fluid. Not a, not a rare occurrence. So that would mean it would be possible for naive B cells in a uh, secondary lymph uh, tissue, like a lymph node, to use its B cell receptor uh, to try to bind these molecules, bind histone proteins, bind ribonucleotide proteins, even bind DNA. So we can generate antigen binding sites that could interact with all of these proteins. It is not out of the realm of possibility because as we know, that you can make billions of different antigen binding sites. So it's not impossible to imagine generating an antigen binding site that would bind a histone protein, a ribosomal protein, or even the structure of DNA. Now, aren't these cells supposed to be removed from the body via negative selection in the bone marrow? Well, if you recall, um, B cells that are developing in the bone marrow, uh, immature B cells, are shown... Uh, extracellular antigens in the bone marrow. They're shown substances in the blood plasma, substances found on the surface of cells in the bone marrow, but they may not ever be shown histone proteins or DNA or ribosomal proteins. So it is very easy to imagine that B cells would leave the bone marrow and uh, not be tolerant of histones or DNA or ribosomes. So they could, you would generate an antigen binding site that would bind those because you're not selecting against them in negative selection. Okay, so if it's possible to have naive B cells that have B cell receptors that bind these molecules, you need to activate these B cells. And for that to occur, you're going to need a T cell response. So how do we get a T cell to confirm that these substances are, let's say, maybe a pathogen and maybe we should attack them, even though clearly they're not pathogenic, they're um, self molecules. So um, here's a macrophage. Now we know what macrophages do. They phagocytose pathogens. They also phagocytose dead and dying cells. They phagocytose our cells. So here's a macrophage and let's say it has phagocytosed some of this dead and dying cell. And so it's taken in, 
some histone proteins conjugated or linked to DNA, some ribosomal proteins. So macrophages uh, break down substances in their phagolysosome, and they present them to T cells using MHG class two molecules. So now we're talking about having the ability to present autopeptides, self-peptides. And again, it is possible that we have allowed T cells to escape negative selection in the thymus because we maybe we never showed them histone peptides or we never showed them ribosomal peptides. Um, so these T cells with their T cell receptors recognize histone peptides or ribosome peptides. And they uh, say, yeah, I bind that strongly with my T cell receptor. So I'm going to activate and I'm going to help any other cell that is also presenting these molecules. So this is uh, linked obviously to MHG class two antigen presentation. Um, and if an individual inherits uh, HLA genes that preferentially present histone peptides or ribosome peptides, that might give them a risk of um, getting lupus. So now these T cells, since they seem to have escaped a negative selection, and bind self-peptides, like histone peptides or ribosome peptides, these T-cells will activate. Uh, if they're CD4 T-cells, they can turn into follicular helper T-cells, and they will help B-cells activate. So that B-cell at the top, it binds histone proteins. And the T-cell says, yeah, sure, I confirm that the peptide that you've taken in is a pathogen, so go ahead, unleash that attack. And now, sadly, we are unleashing an antihistone uh, immunoglobulin attack. So, not good for the body. Down at the bottom there, that B cell uses an ant its B cell receptor to bind DNA, which is weird to think that we make antibodies that bind DNA, but definitely it's possible. How does this B cell be um, helped by the T cell? Well, the B cell will um, bind the DNA, which is... Um, associated with histone proteins, and it will take in this complex, complex via receptor-mediated endocytosis, and then it will break down the contents. Now, it doesn't present DNA on MHE class two molecules. You can't do that. You only can present peptides. But what it can present are histone peptides. So this B cell with its B cell receptor binds DNA, internalizes what it's binding, breaks it down, and presents histone peptides to the T cell. And the T cell says, yep, you are that peptide. I recognize it. Go ahead, unleash an attack. And that B cell activates and now secretes anti-DNA anti, anti -DNA antibodies. One of the characteristics of individuals with lupus. Third one over there, that B cell that's binding ribosomal proteins and other ribonucleotide proteins it gets confirmation from a T cell saying, sure, go ahead, unleash an attack. And that B cell now unleashes anti-ribosomal um, uh, antibodies. So all three of these instances could occur in individuals who have um, lupus. They typically make these anti-histone or anti-DNA or anti-ribosome antibodies. So that's how... Um, that occurs in terms of generating a antibody response. Now, what are these antibodies going to do to damage organs and tissues? So again, here's some cells, and we've got some histone proteins, some DNA, and some ribosomes. Well, when, like we said before, cells die, and their contents could spill out into our fluids, our humors, our blood, our interstitial fluid. Well, now, if we make antibodies that bind these soluble molecules, we're going to create what's called immune complexes. So if you look on the left there, we have an immune complex. We have IgG that binds DNA, and we have these DNA strands floating around. So IgG is going to link to DNA, and IgG's got two antigen binding sites, so it will cross-link these DNA strands, and you get this uh, complex, and we call it an immune complex because it's a mixture of soluble antigen and antibody. So this is a type 3 um, a reaction where antibodies um, and bind soluble antigens. And on the right there, we've got IgG that binds histone proteins. And again, 
histone proteins having been released from cells due to damage. And now the antibodies bind the proteins and they form this immune complex. So why are these immune complexes bad? Well, if these immune complexes um, are in the bloodstream, and we know IgG is found in the bloodstream, and these proteins can be released into the bloodstream, or these cells can be dying in the bloodstream and releasing their contents, then what occurs is that these immune complexes, uh, or IC, uh, standing for here, can actually deposit, they lodge in different places in the body. They lodge in the walls of blood vessels, they lodge underneath blood vessels, and they deposit in preferentially in certain areas of the body, and that's going to be bad. Why is that gonna be bad? Well, if you recall, uh, anything covered in IgG uh, will promote the classical pathway of complement activation. So the C1 molecule binds IgG. These immune complexes have IgG in them. So C1 will bind it, and what's that going to trigger? That will eventually lead to the formation of the classical C3 convertase. C3Bs are now affixed to, what are they affixed to? You can attach C3Bs to anything. You could attach them to proteins, like histone proteins, or to DNA, or even right to the antibodies. So now these immune complexes, these clusters of antibodies and, and uh, autoantigens, are covered in C3Bs. Now, we know during the formation of uh, C3B, you get the formation of C3A and anaphylatoxin. Um, these C3 convertases um, can also form C5 convertases, the classical C5 convertase. And now, not only you, now, of course, there are, no, there are no membranes to attack here, but that's okay. You can still make the C5 convertase cleave C5 into C5A and C5B. And now that you have C5A, that's also an anaphylatoxin. And if you recall, anaphylatoxins induce inflammation recruit immune cells to these sites, um, and uh, inflammation is going to be bad if these uh, sites uh, where these immune complexes cluster have repeated inflammation. The other thing that happens when immune complexes deposit in different organs and tissues, you've got all this complement activation occurring around the immune complex. Now complement can also be attached to nearby cells. So you've got bystander cells by in various organs and tissues, um, they're not covered in IgG, but you've got the C3 convertase um, being activated and now C3 are being cleaved in C3A and C3B, and C3Bs are, are being attached to anything in the area, immune complexes and even, even nearby cells. So now C3Bs are attached to our cells because of the dep deposition of immune complexes. And that's not good for our cells to attach C3Bs to them. Yes, we can repel C3 uh, complement via complement control proteins, but those aren't 100% effective. So now we're damaging our organs because of uh, abnormally high complement activation. Why? Because of the formation and uh, activity of the immune complexes, complement attacking immune complexes. So when this occurs in the kidneys, as it does very often in individuals who have SLE, they, many of them suffer from what's called glomerulonephritis, which is this inflammation that goes on repeatedly in the kidney, similar to good pasture syndrome. Um, but if these immune complexes depositing in the kidney, causing inflammation, complement fixation, will lead to damage of, in the nephron, and the filtration apparatus will eventually uh, deteriorate due to repeated inflammation, due to damage via complement. And so individuals who suffer from lupus sometimes have kidney damage. Um, if these immune complexes deposit in the skin, inflammation in the skin usually produces a rash. So you've got redness, you've got swelling, and some, there's a very, uh, a very uh, characteristic rash that occurs in the face of some, uh, some, but not all individuals with lupus, and that characteristic rash is due to the deposition of immune complexes in uh, blood vessels under the skin in the face. Uh, individuals, some individuals who suffer from lupus ha have joint pain or arthritis due to these immune complexes depositing, collecting in the joints. And then when these immune 
complex here in the joint, inflammation in the joint damages them and leads to pain and arthritis. So um, that is SLE, and those are some aspects of SLE uh, or lupus. And again, it comes down to a type three reaction, soluble immune complexes, things like uh, DNA, uh, histone proteins, ribonucleoproteins, uh, an individual's immune system makes antibodies against those. And those antibodies bind the autoantigens, form these immune complexes, which can lodge into different part of the bodies and cause repeated activation of complement, repeated inflammation, which eventually leads to tissue damage.